Our next speaker is uh, Nicolas Rupin. Which is yours. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, glad to be here. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a break from TCS or Theoretical Computer Science. Uh, my name is Nicholas Rubin. I work at Google Quantum AI in the on the algorithms team, uh, usually focusing on compilation and design of physical simulation algorithms. Uh, I entered quantum information about uh, eight years ago uh, now. And before that, I was a computational condensed matter physicist uh, working on chemistry things. And so this talk today is actually going to be at the interface of these two topics. Um, now, this title uh, sounds like something that might have been generated from Gemini or ChatGPT. Um, it is indeed about how to apply quantum computers to the uh, modeling of inertial confinement fusion. Um, and it turned this was actually a really surprising uh, application of quantum computers uh, that I'll, I'll talk about. Um, and so the uh, the work has been in actually in collaboration with many people, uh, largely with a group from Sandia, QSimulate, uh, and then special thanks to Dominic Berry, who's sitting in the back there uh, working in quite a lot of the compilations. And so I'll be representing the, the overall group. Okay, so uh, just as sort of a uh, preliminary before we get into the fusion modeling. Uh, one thing that we've done at Google uh, is develop a small industry of analyzing uh, constant factors in algorithms for physical simulation. Um, physical simulation, you know, I probably don't need to introduce as a very valuable application of quantum computers. And so our goal is actually to understand precisely how long the best quantum algorithms are going to run for simulating important problems in condensed matter physics or specifically chemistry. And so you've probably seen us talk about academic problems like FAMOCO. This is the active space of an enzyme that fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of hype about applying uh, quantum computers to drug design. And specifically, we looked at uh, something that is actually has an open computational chemistry problem, which is P450 here, and then also things like battery cathodes. Um, and so uh, some of these, some of the, the, the way that this, these problems actually work is that we go and collaborate with a lot of chemists and we figure out precisely what is the type of computational question that they need to ask to answer some particular problem. So for example, in the P450 case, uh, I hope all of you have avoided COVID, but if you did get COVID, you might have taken Paxlovid, which is an antiviral. And that is actually a drug cocktail, one of which is a P450 inhibitor. P450 is a drug that act, or is an enzyme in your body that actually metabolizes a lot of xenobiotics. And so to, for, to make the antiviral more uh, potent in your body, you actually inhibit it so it can stay in there longer. And so actually this is a drug anti-target uh, and there's a particular simulation question related to uh, how... Uh, what is the catalytic cycle here? Okay. So all of these uh, models or all of these studies, uh, we have some motivating computational chemistry question that actually boils down to asking questions about energy differences. And so what we do from a quantum algorithms perspective is try to understand precisely what would be the cost of simulating the I or sampling from the eigenbasis of these systems. And so in chemistry, these are a lot of the work has been looking at second quantized simulations, which is a four mode fermionic Hamiltonian. Um, if you saw Dominic Berry's talk earlier in the week, uh, he showed over the years, there's been substantial progress in bringing the cost of these down, but most of them work as follows. Uh, we are defined some Hamiltonian here related to the chemical system. This is knowledge that your computational chemistry friends uh, have commonplace in their field. Uh, we then use a linear combination of unitary representations that allows us to block encode this Hamiltonian. From this block encoding, we can construct a walk operator and phase estimate that. Uh, the phase estimation, the number of queries to this walk operator are going to scale as a very important parameter, this lambda, which is effectively the LCU1 norm that allows you to block encode, namely put a Hamiltonian with a very large spectral width into a unitary. Okay, so this is the type of process that you might in TCS asymptotically discuss. Uh, you might end at this and say, okay, it's very easy to derive this thing. And uh, we, what we want to do is go one step further and analyze the constant factors. And so uh, a lot of the freedom and improvements that we have seen in the algorithms over the last four or five years have actually been 
right, leveraging the fact that we have quite a lot of freedom in the linear combination of unitary representation of this Hamiltonian. There's quite a lot of structure in this four tensor that represents the chemistry Hamiltonian, uh, specifically because this is coming from a Coulomb interaction, a physical, a physical interaction that we know uh, leads to a positive, positive semi-definite matri matricization of this tensor and other things like, for example, it's low rank. Um, and so uh, we actually compile the LCU for these uh, using a particular form of the linear combination of unitary uh, representation given the four tensor decomposition of the Coulomb integrals. Um, these are just tensor network representations of this particular uh, four tensor here. These all lead to global scalings that uh, have fallen over time, effectively something starting a, a, like about five years ago that scales n to the fourth, where n you can think of as maybe the number of a, a constant factor times the number of electrons in the system. This is the number of basis functions. Um, and then to today, where we have some of the best scaling algorithms that are scaling cubically in the number of basis functions. Um, and we can, after compiling everything, get leading order costs for simulating these systems uh, on within fault tolerance, all because we want to understand precisely how long these are going to take because of the air overheads of implementing fault tolerance and performing quantum error correction on a real device. Um, some operations, of course, like Toffley gates or T gates are gonna take substantially longer or have much, much larger space time volume than Clifford's. Okay, so uh, where do we get to fusion? So you might have concern that uh, we know that's generically simulating ground states uh, is may hard. And so uh, you might have concerns that this problem of using a quantum computer to simulate the ground state chemistry uh, is maybe not the best place to look. A much more natural place to look is actually quantum dynamics. Uh, in some sense, this is the only thing that quantum computers do. They implement things in SU2 and SU4, right? Uh, and so this is sort of the natural language of a quantum computer. And there was actually a very surprising result from 2020 or 2023, just last year from our group, that showed that you can actually get a quadratics or a super quadratic speed up, a quartic speed up in some conditions for simulating the dynamics of electrons in first quantization over even the best classical mean field methods. So if you had some particular mean field method to simulate electron dynamics and you did the best that you possibly could, like uh, time-dependent Hartree-Fock or time-dependent density functional theory, uh, within first quantization representation, we could actually get a speed up over that. And so what we, this was a very surprising result. And so what we did was then search for applications of dy electron dynamics that um, effectively would enjoy this speed up. And we could go find an application that's motivating uh, for uh, this particular problem. Another thing that was actually interesting that came out of that work is that the speed up actually increases uh, at finite temperature. And so this prompted us to look at in the warm dense matter regime. If you are a condensed matter physicist, you'll know that this is a pretty challenging area to simulate. Um, for this, for example, this uh, phase diagram here, you know, we have gases and liquids, and then all the way up here, we have, um, you know, fusion, uh, the sun, and, you know, cores of white dwarf stars. Um, and it turns out that, uh, indeed, there is a problem in fusion that um, lives very nicely in this particular regime. So if you think of fusion, you think of hot things, right? Uh, and the physicist in me might think, well, if it's really hot, there's probably not a lot of quantum mechanics going on and mean field methods would be particularly uh, applicable and they would capture most of the physics that you would need in terms of a modeling problem. But it turns out in an, the inertial confinement fusion setup where they're actually fusing deuterium and tritium uh, to produce uh, a bunch of energy and an alpha particle, um, most of the time, this fuel is actually just sitting in the warm dense matter regime. And the goal of... Uh, the group at Sandia is actually to model the hotspot dynamics of this particular process, the fusion, the, the fusion of the deuterium and tritium. You just get these hot spots that lead to more fusion as the fuel is traversing between, you know, eight orders, five orders of magnitude between the lab conditions all the way up to something on the temperature of the sun. So this is a great target for simulation because it's very hard to make uh, experimental conditions that satisfy that. It's hard to build something that is the temperature of the sun in the lab. Um, and so primarily the focus of all of the studies uh, is uh, computational. Okay, so what, ex what exactly do they model? Um, the thing that they want to understand about a material that, um, or these deuterium tritium mixtures at various temperatures and pressures uh, is actually something called the stopping power. 
Now, this is the source term for a lot of the hydrodynamics equations for these hotspots that lead to modeling of these particular fusion processes. And stopping power is not actually a power, it's a force, it's a frictional force. Uh, if you remember from physics 101, the, you know, the force of the derivative of the potential energy, right? And so here, what we want to model is actually the drag of an alpha particle as it traver traverses a medium, namely this deuterium tritium fuel uh, soup effectively. So uh, what you have as the setup is something that looks like this. These gray uh, dots here are, I had a nice video, but it, it doesn't actually show up in PDF form. Um, what you have is these gray dots and these are high, uh, deuterium and tritium. And here we can label one of these as an alpha particle. And you want to understand precisely how much this is slowing down as it traverses this medium. And this is a quantum dynamics problem. Uh, the way that they do this at Sandia is they start this on some trajectory and it goes around this box and it wraps around and they actually translate this particle at constant velocity. Um, it's not actually relativistic. It's about uh, three or four AU. Um, and so uh, they just watch the system heat up and the amount that heats up is the amount of work that's done on the system. You can also use Newton's third law and say, well, how much work the system is uh, doing on the particle or you know, what is the energy loss of the particle? And that's the goal, namely trying to understand precisely how much energy is lost by the alpha particle to the medium, leading to heating, leading to more diffusion. Okay, so uh, they want to extract stopping power, right? That's the derivative of some energy as a function of distance. So they have to have fairly long trajectories. Uh, they um, usually do this with a series of classical DFT cal TDDFT calculations. Uh, and phenomenological models. Um, most of these calculations are on the order of hundreds of millions of CPU hours. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that there's actually not a lot of techniques between, for example, TDDFT, which is a mean field method, all the way up to the exact simulation. So there's not a lot in between that you can do from a computational perspective. So this is a motivated problem that a group already spends quite a lot of time uh, simulating. And we wanted to understand precisely if quantum computing can help with this particular setup. Okay, so what do we wanna do? Uh, we, again, we wanna understand the energy loss of a projectile as it traverses a medium, uh, i.e. the work from drag. And the drag is induced by the electrons in the system on this charged particle. Remember an alpha particle is a charged helium effectively. Um, the kinetic energy of this, so we want to model the kinetic energy of this particle as it crosses a time horizon. And so this is exactly the type of diagram that we might expect. As a function of the displacement of this particle, so how much it's moved in our computational box, uh, we want to look at the work or the change in the energy as a function of time, which is the slope. These spikes here are all actually physical processes of the alpha particle getting very, very close to one of the fuel, uh, one of the fuel atoms like deuterium or tritium. Um, or, yeah, atoms. Um, so we have a lot of choices, actually, when we design a quantum algorithm for this. Uh, we can do the same thing that we do classically. So for example, we can run the dynamics at, to a particular point in time and then perform phase estimation to estimate the energy tr while traversing the particle through the box at constant velocity. This is what would be exactly analogous to the classical case. Uh, what we can also do and what we do in this work that saves quite a lot of resources is actually promote the particle to from a classical particle all the way to a quantum particle and then treat the entire evolution in first quantization as a non-born Oppenheimer simulation. So effectively, we'll have a wave function for the electrons or we'll have registers that represent the wave functions of the electrons in first quantization. Uh, these would be the X, Y, and Z components in, in each direction. Uh, and then also a... Uh, register set of registers for the projectile wave function, and then simulate the entire process uh, unitarily. Uh, and then at the end of the simulation, measure the kinetic energy loss of just the particle on this projectile register. And that's sort of the setup that we're going to have. A lot of this work is actually guided by classical simulations, TDDFT calculations that tell us exactly the accuracies that we need to simulate to for a lot of these simulations for a lot of these problems. And so here, this is sort of this interplay between taking ideas from you know, asymptotic ideas and the simulation advantage and actually applying them to a physical setting where we can actually get a lot of um, constant factors in terms of the accuracy that we need uh, from simulation and experiment. Okay, 
So uh, what does it actually look like? Uh, here's a, like a not slightly less cartoony version of this. Uh, first, we have our representation of our Hamiltonian and first quantization. Uh, here's the Hamiltonian for the electrons. I've just sort of brushed that all under the rug. And then also we have a, our Hamiltonian now for the projectile, its kinetic energy, its interaction with all the particles, uh, all the other particles uh, and all the other electrons in the system. Uh, and for the electrons, we actually want to prepare these in some thermal state. Right. This is a finite temperature process. And what we've determined actually through some amount of classical TDDFT calculations is that the merman cosham uh, initial wave function, which is effectively occupying the using the Fermi Dirac distribution to occupy higher energy states, um, is a good initial guess uh, for these systems. So we will sample from this particular trajectory, which we can actually prepare wave functions from in linear time. Uh, linear in the number of basis functions. And then the projectile we're going to, just going to represent as a very finite Gaussian uh, distribution. There's some details here about how we actually select the width of this. Um, if you're, for example, want to measure the kinetic energy just by sampling, you might expect that if this is very, very narrow, I don't have to sample very many times to actually look at the kinetic energy of the system. And so I don't have to do some fancier Heisenberg scaling uh, method. I could just run my fault tolerant algorithms uh, for dynamics and then uh, just measure on that register at the end. Um, but it turns out that if you did that, uh, the Fourier transform of a delta function in momentum space, of course, is a Dirac comb in position space. And so that would give this particular alpha particle a an ex physical extent that's larger than the simulation box. Um, we get around this actually by looking at the potential of the alpha particle on a particular grid spacing that we get from DFT simulations. Um, and it, we can choose a finite width such that error is smaller than the resolution that we would need for the simulation. This leads to a result that we can use a Gaussian wave packet for the initial uh, state of the projectile, the alpha particle that has a variance of about six in the uh, units of our problem. Um, of course, in first quantization, the number of basis functions um, we get a the number of qubits required to represent the number of basis function is logarithmic scaling. Um, effectively, this is, you can take a register and then each of the computational basis states represents a basis function of your system. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go a little bit quicker here. Um, so uh, the next step is actually performing the unitary dynamics and uh, we explored two different strategies for this. Uh, one of which is actually using quantum signal processing to build the propagators uh, and then time evolve after we've prepared an initial state. Uh, this is a fairly, this is a fairly well-known result um, where we take the block encodings uh, originally proposed in these papers for first quantization, augment them with the non-born Oppenheimer projectile, uh, and then build the QSP circuits necessary for time evolution. Again, we expect this to be linear in time and linear in the lambda parameter for our block encoding. Effectively, what we're doing is building polynomial approximations to cosine and sine and implementing that. Uh, this uses the improvement from Dominic and folks that gets the factor of two. Uh, I think there's a poster on it outside. Um, the other um, methodology that we explore is actually a real space grid form and applying Trotter to this case. So there's this very nice paper from Guang Hao Lo, Yuan Su, uh, Yu Tong, and Min Tran about giving uh, particular scaling or very tight bounds for how the difference of a particular Trotter formula uh, or product formula and the exact unitary would scale in a fixed particle manifold for a lattice model Hamiltonian. And what we do in this setup is we actually imagine not simulating in momentum space, but position space on a grid, and then determine the constant factors here through numerical simulation. So we explored uh, you know, various uh, um, Suzuki expansions, and then also made our own bespoke eighth order product formula, uh, which ended up being uh, a pretty efficient one here. Uh, these simulations usually go up to about 125 qubits at low filling, and then we extrapolate these to higher filling settings. Um, another example of this of an optimization, uh, especially something that we worked on that reduces the cost quite a lot, is that if you want to implement the kinetic end or the Coulomb interaction uh, on a grid, what you need to do coherently, what you need to do is actually compute one over square root of r, uh, or the, one over the distance, and that requires you to actually compute this uh, one over square root r distance and. Right now, or before this work, the best methods were 
using about uh, 10,000 Toffleys employing a newton raphson type protocol. So newton raphson you can reduce this computation to just additions and multiplications coherently, uh, but it takes about it takes many iterations of that. Uh, that's actually a very common trick uh, numerically to do. And uh, we improved that here through a combination of uh, function approximation QROM and a single step of newton raphson um, in the last couple of minutes here, I'm going to give some of the results. Uh, the last step is uh, actually calculating the kinetic energy loss. Remember, we want to understand precisely how much energy our projectile has lost to the medium. Um, in this particular setup, there's no relativistic losses. Um, and so the main loss is indeed uh, effectively frictional loss, the stopping power coefficient. And we know that in the accuracy, accuracy regime we have here, we actually need very few samples to actually get uh, a good estimate. And this is again coming from the fact that the alpha particle is effectively classical. We just have to, we're just using a non born Oppenheimer description to make our life easier in the quantum algorithm setting. And we can use classical T TDDFT calculations to get an idea of how much we need to sample for a fixed amount of accuracy. We also compared that to um, a very good scaling mean estimation algorithm from uh, Robin Kathari and Ryan O'Donnell that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, this enjoys Heisenberg scaling, which is effectively em employing a type of Grover type speed up. Uh, there, the constant factors are much, much higher in the sense that uh, though it does have lower asymptotic scaling, of course, at the regimes over here on the right, where we actually are in terms of the errors that we need to uh, we're able to tolerate on the estimate of the kinetic energy, uh, just straightforward sampling ends up being the way to go. And so this is sort of a long story in terms of using our insight of the requirements for accuracy and comparison to classical methods uh, with classical computers to determine which are the best quantum algorithms to employ in which particular sites setting. Okay, so uh, at the end of the day, we are able to compile uh, the algorithms, just like we did in the second quantized chemistry case for time dynamics using quantum signal processing uh, to synthesize the propagator and then also applying our eighth order product formula. Uh, and uh, indeed, actually, it turned out that the product formulas are slightly cheaper here. Uh, the reason that we were doing those numerical estimates of the constant factors is because this is a much tighter bound than commutator bounds uh, that you might, or the much tighter estimate of the performance of Trotter um, over comp something like commutator bounds. Um, the number of qubits here is actually higher in, in the product formula case. Most people actually see this slide and ask why that is the case. And that's because there is a QROM here that we're using for function approximation uh, that helps out with the efficiency. And so uh, to put this all into context, um, I'm about to finish up here. Let's take the chemistry examples that the field I think would consider flagship, that P450 case and the FAMOCO case. Uh, there, we needed about 3 tenths 10 to the 10 Toffley gates, here 7 tenths 10 to the 9. And this is the first time that we're actually looking at a quantum dynamics problem at this scale, or what I would call an industry scale, or a scale that is relevant to another large uh, scientific project. And we're really only about you know, three orders of magnitude off of the best classical method or the best simulation methods for chemistry that have been optimized over the last five or eight years. And so I think there's a lot of hope for expanding or improving these methods such that these costs really come down greatly. Um, I'll just very quickly say that a lot of the compilations are done um, in our group using a tool called Qualtran. Uh, what we do is a lot of the algorithms in first quantization and second quantization uh, are written down in papers and sort of either a combo of circuits and English prose. Uh, we've systematized a lot of that and we use uh, this particular tool, which is a graph-based representation of the algorithm. Uh, and it also lets us generate circuits very easily and check things. And then we can do analysis such as look at, look at the, oops, look at the highest complexity uh, you know, subroutines, for example, this one is actually just the cost of swapping electrons into the active register for first quantized simulation. And so um, this actually ends up being the highest cost. The second one, second highest cost are things like um, nested boxes, state preparation and things like that. Okay, so uh, just as sort of a bunch of takeaways, um, this is the first, at least to my knowledge, really industrial scale dynamics problem that has been cost out and that we're trying to understand uh, all the constant factors for. Uh, a lot of this work is about the interplay of how to develop a, quant or a quantum
quantum or take ideas from quantum algorithms development and then sort of apply them in a clever way to a particular simulation problem given the accuracy requirements for that problem. Uh, for example, taking advantage of what type of grid resolution we need, how we represent the projectile, what type of temperature, for example. Um, this is the first non-born Oppenheimer block encodings for first quantization. Uh, they were articulated in Yuan's paper back in 2021, uh, but I don't think the actual block encodings were provided. Then there were a couple of other tricks that uh, Dominic introduced uh, that lets you get very, very efficient computations of Coulomb interactions uh, in, in this particular representation. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, these plots you had on the last or second to last slide on the left, the left two plots, like, uh, could you say again what the, uh, sorry, before, um, so, yeah, those. Um, is this data that was generated classically, like the kind of data you'd like to generate on the quantum computer? Or Yeah, so uh, this green curve actually comes from a stopping power calculation done by our Xandia colleagues for the inertial confinement fusion experiment they have at Lawrence Livermore. Um, and what we were doing there is taking the output of the uh, Merman Kun Sham calculation that they're doing and modeling the calculation of uh, the stopping power, stopping power as a um, from sampling effectively using the output of the TTGFT calculation. That gives us an idea of how many samples that we need to actually take. So here's stopping power, uh, and each of these are run with a number of samples, and this is like the accuracy that we're getting. For each of these. And so this sort of tells us how many times we need to, if we were to run the quantum computer, how many times we would actually need to sample. Um, I it's see. just an empirical estimate of how many samples we need to get this type of precision, which is already extremely high for this problem. I see. So the so the number of samples is incorporated into the overall Toffoli count? That's correct. Yeah. But uh, would then like, uh, you take the, those samples and you generate one point on the left? Is that for uh, all of the points on the left at one? No, it's, it would just be one point. And so you know, we're interested in this at different, um, you know, just like in chemistry, you're interested in the energy calculation at different configurations right. of the molecular setup. And like all the numbers are for one particular configuration. For example, this would be the same sort of setup. This would be for one point and we're interested in different velocities at different temperatures, for example. And so right. we have to run this over and over again. Right, so I guess I'm wondering uh, if you have a sense of for Sandia, like how many of these points do you think they would need is it like 10 or is it like a thousand so it, this is another thing that actually makes this problem very fun uh right now the only physical data set that we have on stopping power for deuterium tritium simulation has like four data points in it uh and they have these great heat diagrams that they like think the partition function is for this and they try to like map out the phase diagram but it's like a complete guess and so they're like adding a handful of data points to that you know, surface would be extremely useful for them. So I think just a handful of these calculations would be very useful. And also, even at these very, very small scales, uh, this would let them sort of benchmark a lot of the TDDFT calculations that they're doing. Those have uncontrolled error. So they really want to know, given a high accuracy simulation, you know, what are, what are they incurring in terms of error? OK, yeah, thanks. That's very helpful. Thanks for the nice talk. So my question would be, uh, within this simulation, can you apply it to, say, phase transitions, like superconducting phase transitions, say, phase transitions second order, like liquid gas uh, fluid type dynamics? Uh, like in a non-born Oppenheimer setup? Exactly. Well, you need it there. Yeah. And yeah. the part of this question, can you approximate um, high moments, high cor correlation fun uh, functions? So for the superconducting example, I actually am not sure how to do this in first quantization, given as an input to the first quantization simulations, you need to fix the number of particles, right? And if you're to ab initio simulate superconductivity, you want to see some condensation in Fox space, right? And Fox space doesn't have a fixed particle number. And so uh, it doesn't make sense to me 
on how to do that. But I think there's other ways that you could simulate that transition, for example, looking at conductance and things like that. No, no, but I mean the approach. So basically you have this uh, creation annihilation operators. You just build, uh, build another Hamiltonian uh, with another tensor in your like prefactors. And oh, in you... second quantization, yes, of course, this is easy to do. In okay. first quantization, no, I don't think you can do it that way. Okay, okay. Uh, then the part for this particular simulation, can you approximate the second order, third order correlation functions for this particular dynamics? Yes, the cost likely goes up as the norm of those okay. uh, the norm of the operators defining those correlation functions. So going back to the superconductivity thing, of course, you would then need to measure like the four mode correlation function for fermionic mode correlation function and the norm of that is going to be higher okay okay so thank you very much for this talk let's thank our speaker again